good evening and good afternoon and i hope you're all having a good day um my name is madhushri and i am happy to welcome you to decolonizing our bookshelves first ever panel vika and i will be the moderators for today's panel where we will be talking about decolonizing curriculum and educational spaces our first speaker is dr ahmed ansari Ahmad is an industry assistant professor in integrated digital media in the Department of Technology, Culture and Society at the New York University. His work and research situates itself at the intersection of design studies, critical cultural studies and the philosophy of technology with interests in decolonizing knowledge production in design and creating alternatives to present day systems utilizing local cosmologies and genealogies of knowledge. His area of focus lies in South Asian Vedic cosmologies and practices and the history and philosophy of technology in the Indian subcontinent. He also works as an educational consultant for universities and has developed curricula for design programs in Karachi, Pakistan. Thank you, Madhu, for uh, it's a very nice introduction. Uh, I'm going to speak, you know, I'm, I'm going to make my sort of um, contribution very concise because I, I would actually prefer that we keep most of the time for discussion rather than just talking about ourselves. Uh, so I'm just going to make some very quick uh, points, you know, and this is mostly coming from my work over the last uh, two, three years working with Pakistani universities in Karachi on, on sort of uh, creating new design curriculums, right? There are two universities that I was working with. One was my alma mater from which I did my undergrad, uh, you know, the Indus Valley School of Art and Architecture. And the second university is Habib University. It's a, it's a relatively new university over there and they have a design program. So I, I wanted to make three quick points. You know, one is a kind of, the, the first couple of points are kind of meta they're slightly larger. They have to do with knowledge production. You know, knowledge, knowledge, we, we, when we think about knowledge, right, all, all knowledge, both in the act of producing knowledge as well as in the act of disseminating knowledge, you know, whether that, that knowledge is being disseminated in the classroom or through scholarship, uh, you know, it, 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 what we have to think of knowledge as doing things in the world, right? So in that sense, all you know, practices of knowledge production, of knowledge dissemination, of knowledge creation, right, of research, of, of producing scholarship, of disseminating scholarship, are not politically neutral acts. Uh, they they are in, entirely entangled in kind of relations of power, right? And so you know, global ac academics who work between societies, you know. Like for example, people like me. You know, I'm I'm sitting in New York. I'm a professor at NYU. I teach here, but I'm also working with universities back home, and to an extent, I also teach over there whenever I go back. You know, to visit. We we are we. One thing that we always we kind of have to always recognize, and we are constantly in the process of negotiating with, is is precisely the ways in which we are at the intersection of different relations of power how we are immersed in different kinds of systems and infrastructures, right, that exert different forms of power uh, in different ways, right, between these systems, uh, as well as within these systems, you know, when we are here or when we are there. And, and this has to, so these kinds of big observations, I think for me, uh, you know, one thing that I've kind of realized over the last two or three years of doing this work is that you know this this constant process of having to think through of having to negotiate in very real terms as well in terms of the interactions that you have with people right uh, as as well as an, a larger understanding of what your actions will lead to within a kind of local system right uh, one has to be one is very conscious of these things and one should be conscious critically conscious of these things uh, as as an academic, right? Uh, you know, there's I find myself as a as a negotiator, as a translator, right? On the one, and there are many particular. When I wrote, um, you know, you guys had sort of given me this prompt. You wanted me to talk about what I'd written in in politics and method. You know, 
one thing I think that I'm constantly having to deal with is, you know, I have a particular kind of position here as an academic. I enjoy certain privileges and I am also like, I do not enjoy certain things. My agency is limited in many other ways in the United States. It's the same thing in Pakistan. And in fact, my position as, as an academic across, you know, the fact that I have a position here alters my position in Pakistan. And the fact that I have work going on in Pakistan alters how, I, how my scholarship is seen over here, right? I wouldn't be sitting in this panel otherwise, probably, you know? And so one has to be very conscious of what one's positionality does in, in both contexts and how they kind of reinforce, how that position reinforces, uh, you know, those positions reinforce each other globally and internationally. I think also, you know, and this is often something I find like oftentimes when, when you see like foreign, uh, you know, foreign consultancies, for example, arriving in Pakistan to give recommendations, right? What they're very unaware of are the kinds of local dynamics the kind of political, the local kinds of political economies and the kinds of local dynamics that are there. Um, and I think as someone who works between both worlds, that's also something that I'm very keenly kind of aware of, right? And that also makes me aware of the particular kind of agency that I have in both contexts, you know? Um, and I think that, you know, this is something that I think, uh, you know, most academics who work across contexts have a sense of, the question is whether we can sort of use that in order to think through more thoroughly the challenges that we face, uh, you know, working in, in both kinds of local contexts. And I think, you know, um, other things like, like, for example, I'll be very blunt, right? Part of the reason for why, and, and this is also, again, a consequence of longer histories, right? And of the coloniality of power with regards to knowledge. Like I'm taken more seriously now uh, as a result of my position here back home than I would be otherwise, right? Now, this is a problem, but it also opens up certain things. It allows me to enter into alliances with local actors that I otherwise would not have been able to enter into. And it, it, there, I think there's a question there too, right? Which local actors am I working with, right? There are, I mean, there are local hierarchies in academia over there. There are, there, just as there is a kind of a, a global kind of economy of, of vertical power structures in academia that also manifests locally as well. Um, and so then, you know, it becomes a kind of a question of, who is it that I choose to ally with over there? Who wants to ally with me over there? Uh, you know, can we, uh, how commensurable are our projects, right? I want to do certain things over there with design education, um, you know, and it's, it's always, I think the last thing, and I'll quickly end, um, I don't want to keep it too long, we're already at 10 minutes, you know, is thinking about like, you know, all kind of knowledge production is syncretic, at least that's what, what I strongly believe in. Uh, so it's not, you know, when we talk about decolonizing curricula, it's not as if, you know, Anglo-European knowledge, it's not black and white, right? The, I think the challenge is precisely how we negotiate the kind of knowledge that we take from sort of Anglo-European systems and the process of sort of working with that and through that to sort of with our sort of own ways of thinking through and the kinds of local sort of knowledge systems that exist, right? So knowledge, uh, you know, even in, in terms of adapting that knowledge to be able to teach it, to be able to derive new knowledges, you know, is a kind of very uh, sort of like, it's a, it's, a, it's a tenuous process, it's full of friction, but it's also syncretic, right? I mean, that's why I, I say, I emphasize the word, the new or the novel, right? It, it's new in the sense that it's not this or that, it's actually something that is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something novel, it's something uh, interesting, it's something new. Uh, I'll just stop there for now. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speakers um, are uh, Mona Bhan and Deepti Misri. Mona Bhan is Associate 
Professor of Anthropology and Ford Maxwell Professor of South Asian Studies at Syracuse University. Deepthi Misri is Associate Professor of Women and Gender Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. Bhan and Misri are both members of the Critical Kashmir Studies Collective, a feminist scholarly collective of five Kashmir scholars, as well as a larger scholarly network known as the Critical Kashmir Studies Network. They're also co-editors, along with Haley Dushinsky, of the Rutledge Handbook of Critical Kashmir Studies, forthcoming in 2021. Can you hear me? Um, yes. Yeah, thank you for getting uh, all of us together. I'll just quickly read the prompt uh, so people have a sense of where um, Deepti and I are waiting ourselves. Um, so the prompt that was given to us by you guys uh, was uh, how narratives about densely militarized zones such as Kashmir even though they are a core part of India and Pakistan's shared history, are largely abandoned by academic discourses and outdated syllabi. Quite paradoxically, education is one of the key ways through which these issues stand a chance of being addressed due to their political nature. How do we think allies within academic spaces can contribute to addressing this uh, misinformation and propaganda, as well as actively shaping conversations to be accommodating of the realities of these contexts. So thank you for that, that really generative prompt. Um, so Deepti and I met the other day to discuss a few uh, points and we would like to uh, also just quickly give you a sense of how we approach the prompt and then hopefully open it up for a longer, deeper conversation. So uh, both uh, the I, Adipti and I are situated, of course, in the U.S. context. Uh, so part of how our, our misgivings with how Kashmir, for example, figures in U.S. syllabi comes from that position. Um, and we are both also from Kashmir. We're also high caste scholars. Uh, uh, so I, I just, you know, keeping in line with uh, uh, the politics of positionality, we want to outline that. And hopefully that will come up in the conversation because we would like to unpack what it means to occupy privileged positions in higher education and academia, especially when cost is becoming such a topical issue of debate here. Um, so uh, most of the times, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about Kashmir in a little bit, but uh, first of all, when South Asia is taught in the, in the US, for the most part, it's an India-centric view of South Asia. Oftentimes, South Asia gets conflated with India or South Asia is reduced to, uh, uh, to India alone. And uh, unfortunately, what tends to also, what has tended to happen uh, over the years, even with subaltern scholarship trying to problem problematize colonial epistemologies, unfortunately, um, there's a blind spot also within the subaltern scholarship on questions of nation, nationality, and territory, especially when it comes to Kashmir. Uh, it's much bigger, deeper uh, blind spot that we will come to uh, shortly. So uh, what tends to then happen is, in addition to raising questions of caste and class privilege, uh, Kashmir is completely erased. And the way it appears, if at all it appears, is mostly in the sort of bilateral framework of India and Pakistan. It's a problem of uh, the partition so to speak. It is anchored, uh, you know, Kashmiri aspirations and their long uh, drawn out struggle for uh, self-determination, for independence and autonomy, um, and, and uh, the ability to live freely is reduced uh, to this point of uh, partition between India and Pakistan 1947, because that's how nationalist historiographies in Pakistan and India both have tended to frame this question rather than locating the Kashmiri right to self-determination in a much prior uh, history that was back uh, many uh, decades, perhaps back to nineteen to the nineteen thirties, um, and 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 this has happened in large part because uh, the scholarship on Kashmir up until I would say maybe five years ago was still very dominated by folks from international relations, from uh, political science. Uh, and even his history, but not critical history. And uh, of course, what they tended to do was normalize uh, statist uh, frameworks to understand uh, Kashmiri politics and history. And, 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 and that's something that has shifted, uh, I would say, in a, in a big way uh, in the last five to six years. And I know Deepti will speak to that, and uh, I will too in a, in a bit. The other big thing that we want to um, 
reiterate here, and this goes, of course, back to this debate on post-colonial scholarship and what it's uh, done or what it's not done, um, and, and how that scholarship speaks to the key question of decolonization, right, especially in relation to issues of Kashmir. Um, so we very much along the lines of what Yves Tuck and Si Wen Yang argue, uh, we want to also reiterate uh, that decolonization for Kashmiris is not a metaphor. Uh, it is uh, a material aspiration. It's a reality uh, that is rooted in uh, the lived experience of Kashmiris under uh, the densest and the most prolonged military occupation uh, in the world, right? So uh, what, what uh, Tuck and Yang argue is that decolonization as a word, as a framework, it's neither, uh, it has no synonym, right? And it's not even swappable. You can't just replace decolonization with some funkier term or uh, a cognate term and then expect uh, it, expect it to uh, translate or capture the kinds of struggles that people are engaged in, oppressed peoples are engaged in um, across the world, it's especially in settler colonial contexts. And uh, they, they also argue that when it's deployed as a metaphor, it, in, it definitely uh, undermines uh, uh, possibilities of real change, right? Political change or uh, undermines uh, uh, capacities for political justice. For us thus, uh, a, a long-term effort of the CKS collective uh, that both Aditya and I are a part of, has been to illuminate through our syllabi, through our editorship, through our, our curatorial projects that we'll also speak to hopefully if we have time, we illuminate the material conditions of occupation and how people, uh, what kinds of frameworks, what kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, knowledge uh, frameworks, but also what kinds of conceptual frameworks, uh, geographic uh, conceptualizations of that territory, what forms of knowledge are mobilized in the service of this larger project of self-determination. Uh, one quick sort of example of that would be, for example, this easy binary between violence and nonviolence that we often see uh, people re re rely on. Um, and it's kind of this liberal fetish with, uh, you know, the binary. And that's something we have uh, tried to problematize because uh, what we see, at least in the Kashmir context, is, um, you know, nonviolence is not necessarily seen uh, as as uh, as as a as a modality of uh, of resistance that's necessarily that separate from people's violent struggles because nonviolent struggles are not meant to delegitimize people's violent struggles and you know there's there's an unfortunately an inherent binary that needs to be problematized uh, which is what I think our efforts have been and again this is not to glorify. Uh, violence necessarily, but to at least anchor it in uh, serious conversations about what decoloniality truly means uh, for peoples um, under, uh, under, under living under siege for now, you know, many, many decades. Um, so the other, the other important thing that we have tried to do through our collective work, uh, which of course includes this syllabi that uh, we'll talk about, is to recognize that a lot of times the way coloniality or the way um, frameworks of uh, colonialism tend to continually impose themselves on people is through language. Is uh, It's also discursive in nature. Uh, so for example, using words like borders where none exist. I mean, uh, the, the line of control, the disputed line of control between India and Pakistan, for example, is not a border. It's not an internationally recognized border. So the moment people uh, talk about the progressive nature of border studies and uh, you know subsume Kashmir within that uh, framework, it is an inherent violence uh, to people's sense of space and place and geography um, and spatiality. So I think uh, part of what we have tried to do then is to invest in rethinking the vocabulary that's often used, often normalized um, in the service of, wittingly or unwittingly, in the service of an occupying force. Um, uh, so uh, finally, I think what we do as, uh, as, as part of the Critical Kashmir Studies Collective is call for an academic approach uh, of deoccupation and decolonization that Deepthi will speak to, one that displaces settler fantasies, uh, it resists the aims of reconciliation and unsettles the assumptions and orientations of liberal civil rights and human rights-based approaches to justice that do not anchor themselves in uh, 
in, in material struggles to decolonize territory and uh, perceptions of justice at the same time. So I'll leave it to Deepthi now, because I know we have limited time. Thank you, Mona. Um, so <clears throat> I wanted to speak to, you know, as a, as a feminist scholar who's situated in women and gender studies, um, I wanted to speak to how a focus on Kashmir also complicates the story of post-colonial feminism, um, you know, as it is taught um, on, on a lot of syllabi um, in the U.S., at least in the U.S. Academy. So, you know, one sort of big way in which I think sort of, um, or one big sort of aspect of post-colonial and also transnational feminisms that, um, you know, that, that sort of the standpoint of Kashmir complicates is, um, you know, the way in which the sort of like the globe is conceived, right? And flows of imperial power are conceived um, in terms of, um, you know, the first world and the third world or the global north and the global south, right? So, you know, many of you will know that post-colonial feminism is, is kind of credited with tracing the impact of, of colonialism um, on women, um, you know, quite frequently, on women from the north, or on, on women in the north, non-west, non in the non-west or the global south. Um, and, you know, transnational feminism has kind of built on that, um, you know, to, to trace the sort of like continuing forms of uh, neo-imperial power, right, um, through the flows of capitalism, for example, in making third world women, for example, available as a cheap labor pool. Now, one of the things that that sort of focus on, you know, third world women in post-colonial and transnational feminism has done is it has made it possible for us to see flows of colonial and imperial power as kind of coming from the global north, right? So in the story of post-colonial feminism, quite often power, imperial fl uh, power flows from the global north um, to the global south, so to speak. Um, you know, the site of sort of like uh, erstwhile European empires. Whereas, you know, looking at the context of Kashmir forces us to interrogate um, that north-south binary or the global sort of like the, the global north, global south binary, or even the first world, third world binary. Right, because what the context of Kashmir compels us to think about is, you know, what are the imperial power relations that can exist within the global south, right? Um, what, you know, with, how do they impact women and gender and sexual minorities within the global south? And so, you know, in 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 that sort of gesture alone, I think, um, you know, Kashmiri feminism sort of compels, um, you know, really complicates the conversation around what what post-colonial um, and transnational feminism <clears throat> should be tasked with. The other thing that was sort of, you know, a big um, aspect of what, you know, a, a distinctive um, kind of strain in post-colonial and transnational feminisms has been the interrogation of this idea of global sisterhood, right? Um, and so post-colonial and transnational feminisms have been very invested in pointing to the fact that, no, there is no global sisterhood we need to pay attention to how first world women uh, and of course, I think in that in that moment, the scholarship was taking shape. Women were still the kind of dominant category of feminism, right? We've opened it up now to to think about other gender and sexual minorities as well. But you know, in in that sort of in 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 a lot of the sort of postcolonial feminist frameworks that uh, you know continue to be taught, um, that is the sort of like primary idea is to interrupt this idea of global sisterhood and to think about how um, you know first world women or first world subjects, including first world gender and sexual minorities. Um, you know, um, have been implicated in the oppression of women in the third world, right? And Kashmiri feminisms, in a, on, you know, in a, in a way performs a, a similar kind of move, but this time interrogating the idea of an Indian feminism that often absorbs Kashmiri feminism into itself rather than recognizing, um, you know, the colonial conditions under which women and other sort of um, minorities are constituted in Kashmir, right? So that's, that's a big sort of imperative for Kashmiri feminisms um, and for the kind of work that we have been doing in the Critical Kashmir Studies Network. Um, you know, um, I think many of you will be familiar with um, Chandra Mohanty's work, um, you know, which also interrogates this idea of third world women as a monolith, right? And so, again, part of this sort of imperative in, uh, in much of that sort of earlier scholarship was to problematize the erasure of um, the agency of women in the North, uh, in the Northwest, right? Uh, the erasure of agency of third world women, so to speak. Um, but Kashmiri feminism, I mean, interestingly, kind of interrupts that monolithic third world woman, in, but in a different way, right? Not to just foreground agency sort of broadly conceived, but to foreground the ways in which women's agency can sometimes 
be deeply implicated um, with nationalist patriarchy. And I think that has been sort of, you know, one of the central sort of um, interventions of Kashmiri feminisms is to point to the ways in which, you know, when we're looking at post-colonial and transnational femi feminist frameworks and we're looking at sort of like Indian women, um, you know, sure, the, you know, the aim can be to sort of recover Indian women's agency and to sort of show that they're not just monolithic uh, victims, et cetera. But not only are they not monolithic victims, they are actually often agents of a kind of violent uh, patriarchal imperialist sort of nationalism. Uh, and that is something that, you know, that Indian feminists have been interrogating, uh, you know, for many decades, right? All of the scholarship um, by people like Urvashi Butalia, for example, on women and the Hindu right, um, you know, has been doing that kind of work as well, right? So for, for a lot of sort of like a lot of that scholarship, the aim was to show, um, you know, third world women, women as agents, but also kind of in, 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 in struggle with, um, you know, with, with sort of Indian um, nationalists as well, right? So Indian women, um, impacted with some some of the more sort of by some of the more conservative strains um, in Indian nationalism, but you know one last aspect that I will point to, in which sort of Kashmiri feminism I think does something very distinctive um, compared to what you know some of the frameworks that came earlier, is that um, you know in in earlier postcolonial and transnational feminist um, scholarship, um, you know from the 90s and you know through the 2000s as well. Um, secular colonialism and ongoing forms of colonialism, uh, you know, weren't, you know, went largely unaddressed. Um, and the focus tended to be on, um, you know, forms of sort of um, European imperialism that had at least formally concluded, right? And part of the project was to say that, like, look, colonialism may have formally ended, but like, here are some of the ways in which, you know, it has been reconstituted through capitalism, for example. Uh, whereas, you know, the, the context of Kashmiri feminism, um, really asks us to, to acknowledge that, um, you know, colonialism in that context hasn't even formally concluded, right? And this is why the, the kind of decolonial frame um, comes into play and has been kind of more useful to us in a way, because we are in, invested in our work in pointing to ongoing for, an ongoing form of colonial occupation within South Asia, right? So it's not like some white country that's colonizing, uh, you know, Kashmir, but you have a sort of like a, you know, a form of kind of post-colonial occupation, if you will, right? You have a post-colonial nation state or, a, you know, an avowedly post-colonial nation state um, that is in this instance, um, you know, the, the imperial power. And so, you know, that, that becomes a very important um, agenda for um, Kashmiri feminism as well. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, and so the way in which I think in our work we have been articulating, you know, what Kashmiri feminism does and is and how to understand Kashmiri feminism in a transnational framework, um, I think one of the points that we sort of make quite frequently is that we need to think of any forms of solidarity, um, you know, that Indian feminists, um, and our work is in the context of, um, you know, um, Indian administered Kashmir, uh, largely, um, that, that, that sort of, you know, any gesture of solidarity that comes from, um, you know, Indian feminists towards Kashmiri feminists needs to be envisioned as a transnational gesture of uh, solidarity and not a sort of, uh, a, a, you know, a national gesture of solidarity. Um, so, so the sort of unfolding of Kashmiri feminism as a kind of sub-variant of, in, of Indian feminism, I think is like, you know, one of the big, big sort of like pitfalls against which our work also kind of um, asks us to be very careful about. And I think that is a sort of persisting, um, you know, sense um, in the way in which these feminisms are part of in relation to each other. Um, you know, so there's a lot more to say. We can talk more about sort of, um, you know, anti-occupation feminism. But I think we have a couple more um, speakers, right? Um, so I, I think I'm just going to give it over right now, and maybe we can circle back to some of the projects that Mona and I um, wanted yeah. to talk about. I think maybe in the are, how are we doing? Hmm? I think in the Q and A session, it might be. Yes. Is that okay? Our next panelist is um, Malcolm Shanks. Malcolm Shanks Dehi is an activist, political educator, and consultant who works to gather people in power among marginalized groups. Born in Washington, D.C., Malcolm was deeply impacted by the cultural and political power of D.C.'s Black movements. He was quickly and personally inspired as a high schooler to improve the experiences of LGBTQ students, and at that point began to advocate, facilitate educational workshops, and run support groups. In the more than 15 years since, Malcolm has created and led hundreds of trainings with thousands of students, activists, and nonprofit workers and artists. Their approach uses storytelling, media, and art to ground people in the whys and hows of oppression, exploitation, and resistance. With these methods, Malcolm has developed projects as diverse as skills training on electoral campaigns, identity development workshops among college students, 
and participatory history projects for community activists. Malcolm is a co-creator of the Zine Decolonizing Gender, a curriculum, an interactive workbook that examines the relationship between transphobia, white supremacy, and European colonialism from a personal political perspective. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vika and Matu, for having me. I'm uh, just really excited. I, you know, I did a little bit of research on the people who are going to be speaking, but I had no idea that I was going to be like <laughs> entering a, a space of such like intellectual generation. So I just really want to tip my hat to you all for assembling this group of people um, and for committing to do it. And, you know, sitting on your laptops there and what looks like your room, you know, making sure we're all, you know, feeling good and feeling here. So I just really, really have deep appreciation for, for, for what you've all, for what you've chosen to do. It really speaks, I think, to the, to the promise of the subject of this panel, you know. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the method, you know, reveals itself oftentimes through, through the practice as well as, as much as through what I think I'm, I'm, I'm about to say or what we're about to say. Um, so I just want to contribute in that spirit. Um, I was asked to speak about the Decolonizing Gender Zine, um, and its full name is Decolonizing Gender, a Curriculum. And I was asked to speak about how some of the uh, interactivity and some of the, the zine format itself uh, is a way of decolonizing knowledge production and how uh, that, you know, is part of the larger trend and in, in some of the, you know, more diverse ways of learning and experiencing education um, and developing our sense of self in this world um, pretty recently. But I figure, like, I don't want to assume that all of you know what decolonization and gender the zine is. So I figure I should probably talk about the story of how it came to be, and that will um, lead into some of the answers that I was asked to address as well. So I think it's uh, first important to know that the zine itself is the is you know sort of the a more recent physical manifestation of a longer term project um, that did not originate in the academy whatsoever, uh, even though lots of the source materials for it are academic materials um, and academic texts. It started because um, I was working at a national political organization inside the United States uh, called the National LGBTQ Task Force, which has been in existence since 1972. And it's a national organization that may, that has mainly worked on the land, on the political landscape of the U.S. to further uh, what one could say is like a rights-based approach <laughs> for LGBTQ, um, you know, um, movements. And so I was working as an organizer there in the context of working on campaigns to pass state and local non-discrimination ordinances uh, for that would that would help trans and gender transgender and gender non-conforming people. I should also place myself. I'm a gender non-conforming person. Uh, I'm a a, a long-term communist, <laughs> which led me to my organizing career on campaigns. I am a Muslim which situated me very uh, intentionally in an anti-imperialist kind of tradition in the United States already because of how African-American com Muslim communities are created and how in our experiences with the U.S. government. So all of, you know, it just kind of ended up being that I was the person who was doing all these things and therefore seeing the pitfalls and the advantages in, in, an, in a proactive, active campaign political uh, political campaign. And so as part of that political campaign, we were oftentimes asked to do what a lot of people were calling Trans 101, um, which is, you know, in a basic introduction to the idea. This is especially the ones that were coming out. Um, I would say some like uh, an introduction to some uh, gender theory that, you know, that common sense and the university could agree on at that time is I think the best way I could describe it. The idea that gender and sex are not the same thing, and so uh, and gender and sexuality are not the same thing, that instead of being one, uh, instead of being two choices or a binary, that there may be a spectrum between two poles, 
that one could choose from in all these different ways. And that's the sort of, you know, and, and it's our personal choices um, that should be prioritized as giving us power and, in or, and taking away those personal choices is oppression. And that is why we should support transgender communities, which is all of which is um, somewhat true, right? And is, and is definitely in the right spirit. And yet we were asked to do uh, something similar on a campaign and found ourselves frustrated because it was me and another person, person who was working class, a working class trans person. And we were like, this doesn't speak to our experiences. Our experiences are, are where we constantly have to be thinking about other factors besides uh, where we're going to buy our clothes or the personal approval of our parents. Um, there are many more factors in, in, in how we construct our gender identity and how we live our lives as, as full human beings. And so ultimately, uh, because I, I happen, to, happen to also have done a certain, a lot of um, international studies, uh, in Middle Eastern studies and South Asian studies and Central Asian studies and happen to be like well aware of the tradition of gender diversity throughout the Eastern Hemisphere, I was like, what if we simply ask the question, how did the whole world get to genders? And take that as the starting point for a conversation with what actually was a group of young South Asian activists in the U.S. Um, who were participating in a youth leadership institute and so we were we were we were brought on board to to give them a trans 101 and we were like well if everybody in the room is going to be a brown or black person why would we base a trans 101 in the experiences of white middle class people and so that's where the um workshop idea was born is is in a tiny little section of a workshop a trans 101 called how did the world get to genders and uh, there was, it was such a lively and interesting discussion that we eventually decided to turn that into a larger workshop called Decolonizing Gender. The reason that the zine is called Decolonizing Gender, a curriculum, is because it is uh, designed as a, as a booklet that you can hand off to another person. And that person can either take it and read it alone and do personal reflection exercises, or they can take it to a group of people and there are group exercises uh, that they could that have instructions and pictures and um, you know uh, uh, also it has a comic book inside of it that's more of a first person narrative but also has a lot of historical information inside of it around this whole idea of uh, what what Maria Lugones calls the coloniality of gender um, but that I'm that I you know that also is the question how did the whole world get to genders and how did gender come to be as Maria Lugones asked right, this, this way that we organize uh, our societies meaningfully. And so that is, um, and so it was, it's sort of in between uh, movement spaces and my own personal research uh, that this project and the Dean has developed. Um, in the time since then, we've done workshops. Every time I do a workshop on decolonizing gender, I do it with uh, a different, I co-facilitate with a different person. And so the true, the true form of decolonizing gender is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an experience, not a booklet. Um, and so each, each time that I've done that, it's been with a different co-facilitator who's usually been, uh, for example, in, in one case, the co-creator of the zine with me, Kahari Jackson, who is also uh, an abolitionist activist in the United States, but also happens to be a brilliant comic book artist. And so we got together uh, in 2017 but the year before that, uh, I had done a workshop with an amazing Black trans activist located in the South, um, who is, among other things, really famous for voting in front of the governor's house and protest of police brutality, um, has created a, an alternative to a white-dominated pride celebration uh, that centers Black and uh, working class people called Southern Fried Queer Pride in, in the Atlanta area. Um, and since then have, have, have chosen to do it with other activists and other uh, and people as well, because it constantly is a, is a dialectical process of, 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 of a meeting to be grounded in the, in the real material experiences of working class, uh, transgender, black and indigenous people of the Western hemisphere. And that is exactly where we decided to ground uh, the, the knowledge consistently. For that, for that reason, uh, it, it's based in a popular education method that comes out of campaigns, which is the idea that knowledge needs to be embodied 
before it can be um, performed. <laughs> that 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 if, if that if we are in fact going to teach someone, for example, to go and talk to to go and to recruit somebody as a volunteer on the street, or to go um, get someone to sign a postcard in us uh, in support of you know transgender people being able to live our lives in full dignity that we can then deliver to elected officials as we were in one campaign then both of those require that we sit with someone that we hear where they've come from and that um after that that we then uh give them skills and the opportunity to em embody that new skill with us supporting and sitting side by side or running side by side with them that's the organizing tradition that i come from and so uh, what that means is that when we introduce a new concept like the coloniality of gender, or as I sometimes call it, the modern, uh, the colonial gender binary, um, just because, you know, colonialities, <laughs> so words like that and their Latinized constructions can, can become easily very intimidating very quickly. The linguistic construction of academic language can, can be a gatekeeping thing in really fascinating ways. You know, it's um, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious is a, purely um, is, a, is an extraordinarily accessible term to the working class that has many syllables, and yet words like intersectionality and neoliberalism are inaccessible. And it's because of their construction and because of what they've been used to do, not because of how many syllables they have, right? And so oftentimes it's just, um, I find oftentimes that rephrasing a word such that uh, we can reclaim some of its Danish or Germanic roots or split up some of that, um, Latinized suffix prefix kind of additiveness that happens in the academy oftentimes does bring it down just a notch so that people can break it down into its constituent parts and then approach it as is through the knowledge through the language skills that they already have or the knowledge the skill the knowledge the language knowledge that they already have. It also makes it easier to translate into their languages. Um, so I think that mostly answered some of the questions I'm hoping. It was a very like winding story-based kind of journey. But um, I think the way, the way that I'd like to wrap up is just by making the point that um, I think to speak to why so many of these different kinds of knowledge are gaining ground in terms of popularity, I would say it's, it's because of a crisis of legitimacy that exists in, inside of the academy. Um, I myself experienced the commodification, the um, demarxification, the the like lack of the the total like deracination as well of um, uh, both black studies and post-colonial studies and women and gender studies. I um, made my way through all three of those departments of Middle Eastern studies of international relations of political science. All of these are so thoroughly divorced from the real life experiences of working class people, and yet um, do have such gems that can speak to the realities of working class people. For example, I think the, the concept of that Medi Lugones has of the coloniality of gender speaks so intimately to the experiences of working class black women in the United States of every gender um, experience that, I, that I've also found it very useful in the context of uh, breaking down uh, barriers to coalitions that can happen between, uh, for example, cis and trans black women, between uh, black and queer men, between um, uh, anti-imperialist and and pro-imperialist uh, black people. Uh, it can, it, it, and, it, and it's. I think it's a decolonial method. I would say in this way, um, or it comes from an inspiration in in in, in a healthy skepticism if not an outright opposition to border thinking so i think i will i will end there yeah thank you our next panelist is um dr luisa prado um dr luisa prado Shide, is an artist and researcher whose work examines themes around fertility reproduction coloniality gender and race in her doctoral dissertation she approaches the control over fertility and reproduction as a foundational biopolitical gesture for the establishment of the colonial modern gender system, theorizing the emergence of technoecologies of birth control as a framework for observing and resisting, disrupting, troubling colonial domination. Her ongoing artistic research project, A Topography of Excesses, looks into encounters between human and plant beings within the context of indigenous and folk reproductive medicine, 
approaching these practices as expressions of radical care. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to be quite quick with uh, with my comment, uh, so we have some time to uh, to have the the general discussion amongst everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mado and Vika, for uh, bringing this panel together. It's been super super interesting hearing everyone uh, and hearing a bit more about your work and your perspectives. Um, I think I, so the, the prompt that you gave me was um, asking a question about how do I see this process of decolonization um, happening and uh, what aspects do I feel that need to be kind of spotlight um, in the spotlight as, uh, as we try to kind of um, deconstruct this, uh, this framework within our epistemology, or our episteme operates, right? So uh, to, to make it very quick and to be like very to the point, I wanted to, to bring out the question of pedagogy also because I feel that um, all of you uh, other panelists have covered so much already. Um, so I wanted to talk about pedagogy because it is something that I've been uh, grappling with also in um, throughout this year and indeed throughout this pandemic. So my work has always been very influenced by that of the Brazilian educator Paulo Freire. Um, and uh, so in his, which I guess most of you must be familiar with, but I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about this. Um, so in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, he um, he discusses that oppressions very often become kind of sedimented and imprinted into, into our minds, into the oppressed's own mind. And this, uh, according to him, is a process, uh, is a part of the process through which people are stripped of their humanity, right? So the pedagogy of the oppressed um, that he proposes is a humanist approach to learning in which um, a process that must be formed with, he says, and not for the oppressed, whether we're talking about individual or individuals or peoples, in this kind of incessant struggle um, to regain humanity. So this pedagogy makes oppression and its causes um, objects of reflection by the oppressed, he says. Uh, fostering, and this is a quote, the political engagement that constitutes the necessary foundation for liberation. Um, so he also warns us, and this I find very important, that emancipation and liberation cannot be imposed or, or bestowed upon uh, someone else. Rather, it is something that emerges as a result of a process that he calls conscientization. Uh, a process uh, of gaining conscience about one's humanity, even in face of, of uh, adverse circumstances. So starting from this understanding of pedagogy as a political endeavor, he, uh, he reasons that in order to combat systemic and persistent inequality, uh, a, a pretty radical shift in educational models is crucial. Right. So he proposes uh, what he calls the educational project as an alternative uh, as an alternative to traditional education. Um, he says that these educational projects are problem posing endeavors in which people can cultivate then their ability to um, perceive critically, to understand things critically and to come to see the world not as a static reality, but as a reality in process, in transformation. So therefore, it is a framing that creates the possibility of shifting and changing the future instead of understanding um, the reality that we're living in as a given, right? And that I find really important. So revolutionary education, um, he also says, cannot uh, subscribe to to um, what he describes as the banking concept of education. 
um, in which an educator will kind of deposit knowledge um, that the students will then collect. And instead, um, this authoritarianism that constructs a hierarchy between student and teacher needs to be left behind if we're talking about revolutionary education and shifting um, uh, uh, the way that knowledge is constructed so that all parties involved in the educational process can be responsible for it. And uh, I wanted to introduce that, and I mentioned that this has, uh, is something I've been grappling with throughout this year because um, this year during the pandemic, actually, I started teaching online. And uh, it's, been, it's been a very interesting process. Um, when I started teaching earlier this year, it was in the spring during the first lockdown here in Germany. And then uh, when, uh, and, and now that I'm starting to teach again, actually, I taught my first class of the semester here last week. Um, now we're back into lockdown here in Berlin. So it's been, um, it's been a very different experience, of course. Teaching online is, is quite different from teaching um, in, in, in a classroom, right? In a physical classroom. Um, and uh, this experience has, uh, I guess, kind of forced me to think about teaching and think about all of these practices, um, and particularly these uh, hierarchies present in education from, um, I guess, a bit of a new perspective. Um, first of all, uh, because it kind of forced me to understand or to kind of displace the educational process in time. And I say that because um, I always start, you know, I, I started last semester and I started this semester too, um, thinking, okay, we're living in a very particular uh, historical moment where um, each one of us might be uh, going through things that, you know, we have no idea. Um, and, uh, it's forced me to, uh, and luckily this is something that was possible within the Institute that I'm teaching, but, um, to reject things like attendance requirements or, um, or participation requirements. Like how can you, uh, how can you require that people participate in a specific way when you don't even know what they're dealing with. You know, they might be sick or they might be caring for someone who is sick. Um, they might be, you know, even just like were living apart from their families and their loved ones um, uh, and going through a very serious, uh, I guess, like emotional <laughs> turmoil. I, I guess we're, we've all been through uh, bouts of that throughout this year. So um, just to, to be short, I'm getting close to 10 minutes. Um, yeah, it's kind of forced me to, to take that into consideration. And because of that, um, I started, uh, you know, it, it's, it makes the dynamic of my work very different, but I started uh, displacing in time. When I talk about teaching being displaced in time, um, what I've been doing is recording my classes and uh, kind of staggering my classes into two uh, kind of, I guess, like time spans or time uh, or, yeah, two time spans. One, I've been recording myself teaching the class, it's, uh, teaching the, the class proper uh, or the theoretical part at least and discussing and uh, kind of teasing out uh, the readings of each week, and then we have uh, a discussion in an online platform. Um, and uh, what's been inter interesting about that is that it has this format, which is a format that the students suggested actually, and I think it's important to highlight that, um, it's allowed people to learn in their own pace. And for me, understanding that, and you know, I've come to see a lot of value in that, and uh, I guess it's uh, helped me also consider this idea of revolutionary education and uh, um, as also something that needs to, to happen in people's uh, own, or to respect 
people's specific conditions and contexts and so on and so on, which is not something that is necessarily always um, considered within the the framework, the the rather strict framework of uh, a university or something like that. But yeah, I just wanted to to propose this as kind of a a starting point, uh, just as a response to your prompt. Uh, but I guess we can have been ten minutes now, so I think we can go on. It was great listening to all of the panelists and I cannot wait to open it up uh, to a general discussion. So I suppose the first question that we have is most of you are involved in academia and in that context, how do you navigate or engage in the process of decolonizing while based so strongly in the framework of a university and Western academia? I mean, how do university and academia deter or enable you towards decolonization? So, I mean, a great question, right? I mean, this also goes back to the, the point about caste privilege or class privilege that uh, at least, you know, Deepti and I both have. And I'm only going to talk for us, um, at least in, in so far as questions of privilege are concerned. So in, in some ways, I mean, we recognize that's our position uh, and we are in it um, and we are part of the structure uh, called the university that is, of course, anchored also in the US context in a very corporatized neoliberal, trying to break down neoliberal uh, model, right? Um, but at the same time, while we recognize that and we are very aware of um, this ongoing conversation about, you know, creating space, for uh, people, for other uh, constituencies, uh, we are very mindful of what we can do with the privilege that we have, right? Especially as Kashmir scholars who have now attempted very hard to uh, rethink academia, right? Rethink the politics of academia um, and figure out ways in which we can uh, use this university space to also think about breaking these silos, academic silos that we usually occupy by engaging with uh, public work. Right, uh, public face work, which both of us have been doing uh, incessantly and with our other colleagues from the CKS for the last decade or more. Um, so for us, I think one way we decolonize to be, again, to go back to your question is to think about how we can do engaged work, right? Even as academics, we're not necessarily, as I said, uh, siloed within our ivory towers, but actually in touch, constantly in touch with uh, communities that we are both from and, and, and committed to um, and work with them to think about how we as US-based scholars can uh, leverage our positions to uh, advance decolonial agendas, particularly those as they connect or as they relate to Kashmir. That's just a sort of quick thing and I'll have Deepthi speak too. Yeah, I'll just jump in very quickly about how one of our collaborative projects um, speaks to those imperatives. Um, so, you know, I just want to point, uh, put on everybody's radar, the Kashmir syllabus, if you haven't seen it already. And um, this was a syllabus that a sort of, you know, large transnational network of Kashmir scholars developed, um, you know, just last year. So shortly after, you know, the Indian government um, kind of annexed Kashmir um, on, on August 5th, 2019. There was a lot of, sort of like mobilization right after this. And, um, you know, this Kashmir, the, the Kashmir syllabus was released. And, you know, one thing that is of note on that syllabus is that, you know, the, the, it, it kind of represents the shift that we try to map in all of our work, right? That, uh, you know, in a lot of, in earlier generations of scholarship, when Kashmir was sort of like a subject of scholarly interest, Kashmiris were more written about than actually sort of like leading or you know, being able to have a sort of um, you know lead that conversation around Kashmir, right? And so a lot of the international relations scholarship that Mona was mentioning earlier was 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 produced by non-Kashmiris. And so you know, the the big shift in the field for us, the big decolonial shift, has been to foreground um, the voices of Kashmiri scholars and Kashmiri Muslim scholars in particular. So one thing that you know, you know Mona and I are kind of taking for granted is that listeners know that the context um, in which we do our work is a Muslim majority context. Um, and so Mona and I are Kashmiri, but we're Kashmiri pundits. 
Um, and so we're kind of situated alongside Kashmiri scholars, um, you know, in a, in a common and co collaborative political project. And we're also kind of situated, um, you know, in relation to a certain set of privileges by virtue of not being Muslim. And so for us, part of the decolonial work is to, you know, pay close attention to, um, you know, what kind of work is being curated and sort of like, and, and, and you know, taught on syllabi. Uh, you know, how are we teaching Kashmir when we teach about Kashmir? Um, you know, those kinds of questions are actually important in terms of sort of like identity and representation and location. And at the same time, I think part of the context is also to recognize that, you know, we are sort of looking at, um, you know, a, a political context, um, a geopolitical context in which there is a tremendous repression of, of voices, of critical voices um, as well. And so, uh, you know, our, our conversations about, um, you know, how to foreground and spotlight and move certain voices forward are always also um, kind of tempered by our awareness of the risk and vulnerability that is uh, involved for certain kinds of people to, to be able to speak about the conditions of colonization. And, and to quickly sort of add to that, that's why this conversation about who can speak and when someone can speak uh, cannot simply be reduced to uh, identity politics in our case, because I think in, in most cases, what's happening, people who have the privilege to speak must speak up, even if they occupy a space. I mean, that space needs to be occupied in, in many instances, not of course in every instance, but in many instances by uh, st strategically calculating the kind of risk and the vulnerabilities that we, uh, uh, that we, we embody. Right? And on that basis, we decide who speaks and when someone speaks or when someone just sits back uh, and lets someone let let someone else take the lead. So I think those are co conversations that can only happen when you are committed to a collaborative spirit, uh, and and that's the other way we are decolonizing uh, the university because the universities tend to privilege atomized scholarship. They tend to privilege individual modes of learning and knowing and knowledge production, and that's something uh, as a collective we really stood up against. So uh, Malcolm, you brought up a really interesting point about language. Um, so in um, the work we've been doing with decolonizing our bookshelves, we're trying to translate a lot of um, current sociopolitical um, terminologies. And um, so um, how can non-traditional forms of academia make these um, discourses more accessible in multiple languages? I would like to oh, add to that yeah. question. Um, I would, we would love, I think this panel has a lot of um, people who speak other languages than English. And so I think it's always been a question where you kind of, how do you communicate this to your conservative parents or your relatives? I mean, it starts from very basic conversations and we just want to understand that language is a very big gatekeeping tool and how we can surpass that. Um, I can speak very briefly. I think the answer is is actually that we start by talking to our parents and our grandparents. Um, I found that so I'm I'm a I, I I guess I come from the opposite direction. I I have the social privilege of, of speaking a dominant language from birth, colonially speaking English, uh, even though I'm not like racially right. Everyone's ideal is an English speaker, <laughs> um, but however. Um, I do still speak five languages, <laughs> and so that, you know, so have moved then in the other direction. Um, and what I have found is that, for example, if I'm sitting with someone and I try to use a word like, you know, coloniality and just translate it over, you know, even if I'm translating to a, a Latin, a, a Romance language like Spanish or Portuguese, for example, um, that it still might not actually hold the same, there are so many concepts that are untranslatable and should be, um, and it's only by, uh, there's an indigenous uh, concept among the Haudenosaunee people of North America, seven generations wisdom, that um, it's, it's through talking to, it's through looking at, it's through learning from seven generations back and uh, thinking and, and, and empathizing seven generations into the future that we can attain true knowledge and so I actually think that uh, our, I found that many people's grandparents who don't speak English actually hold a lot of the keys of knowledge in terms of 
um, non-binary, gender non-conforming people that they already had awareness of um, and knew about and simply have not been given the uh, opportunity or haven't been asked asked the questions just about like, what was that like? Was, you know, um, I think there are some, we had a whole conversation, for example, about how daughters who leave their families and go away to, go away to school occupy a total um, degendering, you know, kind of thing. And so much of the language that we use to talk about that actually can hold so much of the knowledge that we can think about in terms of uh, the gender bi non-binary. So I'll end there. Yes, Emma, did you raise your hand? I would like to speak to that question and also, you know, I have to leave it at, in two minutes at 1.10. Um, so I just wanted to kind of also speak to the last question to some extent in this one. You know, I always, the way that I think of education is that, you know, the purpose of education is to uh, build a critical relation to one's reality, the reality that one occupies. And, uh, you know, and, and there's a, the, the, it's not just that one needs to understand and build a critical relation to one's reality, but with the intent that with that critical relation, one can imagine and then enable forms of practice, of praxis that transform that reality. And the one thing that I would say is, you know, in my own experiences teaching in Karachi and, and working there, you know, I, I think and one thing that the, that the teacher must do, even within the university system, is, is bring to the fore a critical relation to the university, right? Uh, and the ways in which the university as an institution molds how one is learning, what one is learning, and so on and so forth. With regards to language, language plays a really important role. So I, let me put it, I'm trying to figure out how to best say this, but engendering a critical relation to one's reality means interrogating the very kind of language, the metaphors of thought, right? And, as a, and the very ontologies, right? The concepts that one employs in order to think through one's relation to reality, right? both interior reality and exterior reality. Uh, I think this is essential for, for any kind of decolonial initiative, right? So I'll give a very quick example and then I have to leave, unfortunately. Uh, you know, like in, in, in Karachi, uh, one of the faculty that I'm working with over there is teaching a course in interaction design. And one of the things that we teach, you know, we teach metaphors in relation to design right? Interaction designers. So we teach George Lakoff and we teach post-structuralist kind of like discourses on metaphor and language, right? And how sort of like you, you cannot think of concepts outside of metaphors, right? But then, you know, we, he and I were having a conversation and he said, you know what, after we did that class with the whole Anglo-European perspectives on metaphors, he brought in a, a few people to, into class who, who do this kind of work in Urdu and Sindhi, uh, Karachi is in Sindh, right? Um, in Urdu and Sindhi. And they had a whole discussion with the students on metaphor, on the understanding of language of Urdu and Sindhi and how we understand metaphor and employ and use metaphor differently in Urdu and Sindhi. So I'm just putting this as an example of, you know, I think it is very necessary that we learn to get to understand how we employ language why, you know, what kinds of metaphors we use locally, but also as a means of thinking about languages, like why is it that we have the concepts we do in the, in the language that we use, right? As a way to getting to rethinking ontologies, right? Can we rethink, uh, say for example, even basic, th even the, the things that we hold closest, right? Uh, you know, to think about our own identities, concepts like gender, concepts like ethnicity, concepts like caste, why is it that these concepts became like why is it that we define these concepts in the way we do why is it that we employ language in the way we do around these concepts right i think that that really is what i mean by a critical relation to reality in the service of rethinking these things in the service of then being able to move beyond sort of certain ontologies uh and you know maybe even create new ontologies right to think through <laughs>
uh, new concepts, new ways, uh, in the hope that they will lead to, you know, more equitable, more just, more sustainable, uh, you know, programs and infrastructures and systems. Maybe I'll just tell a short little scene or, or story, a moment that made me uh, kind of reflect and think about many things. Um, a couple of years ago, I was doing an artistic residency uh, where I met this wonderful Australian artist called Dale Harding. Uh, Dale is, um, uh, Dale's family is indigenous from Australia and we were kind of talking about our own kind of backgrounds and, and getting to know one another. And at some point, Dale asked me if anyone else in my family was an artist. And I said, no, not really, you know, in, in Brazil, it's, it's complicated, like making a living as an artist is not something that is very feasible for, for most people and so on. And I was only able to, to do this also um, because I'm in Europe, I'm very aware of that and so on. And he asked, but no one in your family like makes things and so on. And I was like, Oh yeah, like my grandpa, he used to, uh, he's from like Northeastern Brazil and he used to um, make like improvised poetry and play the accordion. And my mom always, um, she, she grew up like in a family of 10 kids. So she would sew clothes for everyone. And he's like, so they're artists. And it was a moment when I was like, oh, okay. The way that I interpreted the question, I understood being an artist, and I think that you know goes for other things too, but I understood being an artist from a very hegemonic point of view, right? And my, my framework, my framing of that was, was constrained by that kind of insidious um, kind of hegemonic idea of what being an artist is, which is tied to uh, also like, a capitalist notion of can you make money out of that? Um, are people paying you to do that? When actually, no, you know, you can frame it uh, in another way. So what I want to, to kind of say with this like short little story is that it's not because we're not naming something in a specific way that it doesn't exist. And these forms of resistance and these forms of, um, of, uh, decolonization exists whether we call it decolonization or not you know they, they're there people have been surviving you know for so long and and making their own futures and their own worlds for so long independent of whatever academia wants to call it in at any given point so yeah that's kind of the the little story that i wanted to to tell to finish this Well, I can, I can. All right. Um, if, you know, yes, please like go I, ahead. If, if I could just have a minute because we wanted to share, um, you know, just from, sure. from the Kashmir syllabus um, that we sort of, you know, played a part along with many other sort of Kashmir scholars uh, transnationally in developing that part of our sort of decolonial praxis is also citation and curation, um, you know, in the context of collaborative work. So, in that spirit, I want to at least sort of like, you know, if I can quickly share my screen and just sort of um, share with you the kind of work that um, we have, you know, been kind of invested in doing. This is the Kashmir syllabus, um, you know, your listeners can look it up um, pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, I just want to throw up some of the names who are, um, you know, in this conversation, um, kind of leading this conversation, uh, in charge of the fields, and one of the things I also wanted to sort of spotlight is that you know in this in this initial week on theorizing occupation and resistance, we have a combination of scholarly and non scholarly voices right as a way of pointing back to something that Malcolm was talking about is that the academy is not the only site of theorizing um, you know there are sort of in fact our, our best theorists are people on the ground who actually have the experiences of occupation and colonialism and settler colonial uh, and, and you know settler um, colonial experiences that um, we all have been talking about. So I just wanted to put that up there and encourage your um, listeners to check out the Kashmir syllabus. So I'll stop sharing. <laughs> 
Um, for listeners who are based in India, unfortunately, uh, our government has uh, blocked um, Stand with Kashmir's website. I just wanted to put so you can access it, but through multiple ways, you can get in touch with us. We will share it with you. And Vika, over to you. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you all so much for joining our panel. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for the time you put in into like doing your presentations and like talking to us. We appreciate it so much. Um, and um, to our listeners, um, you can um, find us across social media at um, Decolonizing um, and on our website, um, link in bio everywhere. Um, thank you so much, and um, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day and week, and take care.